set that up. Okay, and before I get started, let me just introduce myself. Um, my name is Dr. Carl Moore, and I'm an associate professor in mechanical engineering uh, at FAMU FSU College of Engineering. And this is the first of three lunch Zooms for the next three Mondays. And this first one is on perfect poster presentations. Um, and all of them, the, the goal of these uh, presentations or these Zooms that we're gonna have for the next three weeks is to help mainly grad students, but I think anybody can, I think any student can benefit um, on doing things that will help propel their career, both as a grad student and after they graduate. And let me just go ahead and share my screen to show you some of the things that we're gonna be focusing on over the next upcoming uh, Zooms over these next few weeks. Okay, hopefully you guys can see this is not too small. Some of you may have already seen this particular flyer. And so what we see here is that there will be three Zooms, and this is the first one um, on perfect, perfect poster presentations. And next week, uh, we'll have a Zoom uh, called Ramp Up Your Slides. And uh, that will be uh, focused on what is now maybe not considered a new presentation paradigm um, in terms of slide creation, but one that was initially popularized by Steve Jobs. Um, and our, uh, one of our associate provosts from Florida A&M will be doing that presentation. He's also a professor in the uh, Department of Physics. Um, our last meeting will be on the 8th of November, and that one will be entitled Navigating Conferences with Confidence. And the purpose here is to, uh, many of you as grad students or even as undergrads are going to be going to conferences and presenting research and what we wanna talk about in this particular meeting um, on the 8th of November is how to navigate that conference from a professional standpoint. So how to walk up and meet other faculty members if you're a student, how to meet students um, from other universities, um, how to conduct yourself maybe even in a um, over Zoom conference, because we know that lately a lot of conferences have not been face-to-face, -face. Um, how to develop a research elevator pitch you know, so to take the research that you're working on and condense it into something that you can quickly explain to someone. And so that will be on the 8th of November. So each one of these Zooms, I'm hoping to keep to one hour. And um, my, my, my desire is that there be time for question and answer. Um, since I am doing the Zoom on my own, um, and I will be facilitating, helping to facilitate the ones that come after this, um, but on this one, I'm on my own, so I may not always see the, sh the chat. And you can always feel free um, to speak up. Turn on your mic and say, Dr. Moore, Dr. Moore, or, you know, uh, what about this? Or you mentioned that, and that's perfectly fine. I think in this format, we're going to definitely need you guys to speak up because I may not notice your chat. and I may not notice your little hand wave pop up. So other than that, I'm ready to go ahead and get started. Okay. Now, let me just check with you guys. I don't think you're seeing, let me change something for a second. Okay. Does everybody, can you guys, can somebody tell me, do they see um, one poster up on the screen right now? The first slide? Yes. Okay, title slide, great. And I'm hoping that none of it is cut off. And so when I get into it a little bit, if, if it's, uh, I'll probably just ask you guys, because I gave a presentation in Zoom a little while back and part of it was cut off on the left-hand side. So, so the title today is Perfect Poster Presentations. Um, this is part one of our professional development series. And this series is sponsored by a Title III Graduate Engineering Program. The presentation that you guys are gonna see was uh, made by me and a student who worked with me from the School of Business here at Florida A&M School of Business and Industry named uh, Chris Colston. So first, let's just define what we're talking about here. Um, what is a research poster session? Um, 
a research poster is a visual presentation of research information. And so that's valid for all different um, colleges and majors. A poster session, and for those of you who have not been to one, is a large social gathering for researchers and scientists. So it's meant to kind of be a little bit less formal than a traditional presentation where you stand up at the screen and you present your slides. In this case, people are milling around and they're talking to you. And that really helps us guide what we're going to put on our posters because we're trying to, in a way, attract people to our poster. Here, what you see on the screen are two different poster sessions that I've just grabbed off the internet. And so we have one at the Society for Neuroscience in Chicago. And then we also have an undergrad summer research symposium at Brown University. And you guys can see they can become quite crowded and people just walk around and they see your poster and they come up to it and they talk to you and you explain um, what is on your poster and what you did in your research. So for today, for our table of contents, my goal is going to be to demystify the creation of the perfect research poster. These are the different items I'm going to cover. Um, so getting started, uh, poster layout and spacing, font issues, graphics and visual aids, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and using Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, and finally, getting feedback and printing your poster. The goals of a research poster. Um, one, we want to publicize your ideas and work. Okay, so that's the main point to your poster. You want to display what you did and how you did it. Um, you want to present your conclusions. Um, and a big one, of course, is that you want to encourage viewers to ask questions and to read your papers or your associated paper. Now, this might not always be the case. At some poster presentations, your poster will be all that there is. And in others, there is a paper to go along with it. And that just depends. But in either way, we want to encourage people to come up to you and talk with you, to engage with you. Finally, to meet, to interact, and to learn from the session participants. And so people are coming up to you and they wanna meet you and they're gonna learn from you. And you're gonna be, in this case, you're gonna be the professor, you're gonna be the teacher. Now, here's my disclaimer as I get into this presentation. Good versus bad posters. We, and you guys as the viewers here, you're gonna somewhat disagree. You'll disagree with me sometimes and you might disagree with somebody you're watching this Zoom with on what is the best and the worst posters. Cause I'm gonna do a lot of showing a good poster or a poster I think is good and then showing a poster I think is bad. And there's a possibility that we could disagree on that and that's okay. There will be more agreement on which posters are pretty good. So we'll, we'll, there'll be more agreement about that. Posters that are kind of in the middle. Examples in this presentation were chosen to illuminate specific aspects. And so what I mean there is There'll be a poster that maybe has a great color scheme, but maybe the font is really poor, right? And so there can be good and bad things on the same poster. And what follows in this presentation are some generally agreed upon do's and don'ts. So getting started, we need to realize the goals of your poster. And this is the display work, encourage questions, meet and interact with the participants. We don't want you to, well, here's the, the way to say it. Don't forget to read the conference information. Um, discover your audience and rules for poster size and orientation. So as an example, at your specific conference that you're creating this poster for, there could very well be a statement saying that your poster should be in um, portrait format or landscape. Um, they may even tell you the size that your poster needs to be. So you just don't create your poster based on what you've done for a different conference, right? So we got to read and make sure that we understand what those required details are. What do you want to say? So as you get started, you need to think about two points, maybe three points. So in your poster, you cannot cover everything under the sun. And you may not even be able to cover everything that you've done in that in this part of your research, but you're going to need to kind of focus in on a few items, maybe two or three items that you really want to get across. Better yet, consider what you want people to remember, right? Many of these poster um, conferences end up being um, contests, right? And it's a possibility that you're trying to win. In that case, what do you want to leave the person who speaks with you about your poster? What do you want to leave them with? What single idea? 
remember, your poster provides a quick overview. Limit your text and use strong images. Images will stay with people more than the text will. And consider whether people will be encouraged to approach your poster, okay? So are you creating a poster that is visually engaging? This is not always as important with a paper, right? With a paper, we might be more skewed towards the text, right? But even in a lot of papers you see, you'll see on that first page, there will be an image, right? There's something to kind of grab the eye, especially in terms of titles, right? All those things are also important with posters. Think visually and plan. So please, please, please sketch your posters to, to scale with a pencil first. And I've done this plenty of times with students. So we'll get on the whiteboard and we'll kind of say, okay, we have this poster format. I'm, I'm sorry, a, por a portrait format poster as an example. And we'll kind of list, we'll say, okay, well, this area is gonna be our title. And then we're gonna have an introduction here. We're gonna have this image over there. And so you're kind of laying things out on a whiteboard or on paper first. You just don't wanna jump on the computer and immediately start. You wanna give yourself some freedom, right? To move things around. And that's best done on paper or on a whiteboard. So in terms of layout and spacing, Let's think of the background as being important here, right? We want 20 to 30%, right? So a little less than a quarter up to about a third of the real estate on your poster to be free space, right? And so remember, you're not gonna cover everything. And so when someone looks at your poster, they're gonna see some areas that are blank, right? Where there's not an image and there's no text. We want you to be creative, right? And so we wanna avoid the slideshow format. Now think about it, a lot of times we know that we get to the point to where we are rushed for time. We're creating our poster a lot later than we probably should have. And we already likely have some PowerPoint presentations on our research. What we don't wanna do, what I wanna encourage you guys not to do is to take those slides from your PowerPoint and just place them on a poster, right? And that case is gonna look like you did just that. It's not going to look creative and it's going to be it's going to be boring, right? We want to also we want to evenly distribute. We don't want to make the user jump around your poster. We want the the direction of reading to be obvious. And so we see here on the examples um, that I have here on the screen, we want something where when the user looks at it, they immediately know what to read first, second and third. Because it's important to remember, guys, that while you're at the poster presenting to one person, other people may come up and they may be reading or looking at your poster and not really look, listening to you at that moment. And so we don't want to have your poster be so confusing for something like the redirection that they don't even know what's going on unless you explain it to them. It, it needs to kind of stand on its own, if that makes sense. We also want to have visual pauses, give the reader a time to take a pause. In some ways, that's done by leaving some free space on your poster. So let's look at a few examples of layout and spacing. And I'm going to be great if I could get um, some people speaking up here, but I don't want to make the Zoom too, too um, so you guys will lose. I'll lose track of everybody speaking at the same time. But here's my first example of layout and spacing. And really what I would like to know is, do people find the layout and spacing of this poster, they find it really good or not so great? The layout isn't too bad. Like I could read it. Yeah, yeah. Now in terms, what about in terms of the redirection? On this poster, the redirection isn't that clear. I'm not sure after I read the first block in the upper left, should I be going to the right or should I be going down? It's not immediately obvious. Let me come out and see if I can see you guys. Okay, so it's, so it's not that obvious here. And otherwise there is not a bad looking poster. Let me go back, let me make sure that I'm in the right setting. Okay, there we are. Okay. So can everyone see the far left edge of this poster? I just want to make sure that nothing's cut off. Yes. 
Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Okay. And so I think that this poster, while it's, I think it's visually kind of pleasing, redirection is not obvious here. And so these are some of the things I noticed when I first picked out this particular poster. It's a little bit more basic, right? So it's, it's almost like a PowerPoint slideshow. It almost looks like they had some slides and they placed them on the poster, like I was saying before, that we want to avoid. There is a decent amount of free space, so that's good. But the redirection is not so obvious. And that's, that's obviously a no-no, because the person is not going to be sure which direction they should read after they read that first upper left block. So let's look at a different one. What about this one? What do you guys think? Too much wording, too much um, sentences. Too much what? <clears> too <throat> much sentences. It writes a lot. Yes, there's a lot of text on this poster. What about the redirection here? What do you guys think? It's better compared to the first one because of the natural order of how a paper would be. Exactly, exactly. You see, the, for example, the orange introduction, materials and methods, results, and so on. It's kind of obvious that you go from introduction to materials and methods, then to results. And so that makes it a little bit more obvious, but there is a lot of text here. So a lot of reading to be done. Now, here's the thing about the reading. If someone's at your poster and there's this many words, they're going to want to, well, I don't know if they're going to want to read them. They, they, some people may not want to come up to this poster because there's so much verbiage here. But if somebody is reading it and you're standing there, are you going to be talking to them while they're spending time reading all of these sentences, right? So that's going to be confusing. So that's why we want to keep the uh, word count a little smaller so that you guys can still interact. And so here I would say that the headings do help with the redirection in this case. And somebody mentioned that. There's uh, plenty of free space. And I think there's a pretty good use of color, right? It's mostly black and white, um, but there's lots of reading required in this, in this particular poster. So let's see a different example. Here. Here, I think we still have the words that kind of explain our redirection. And we also have some numbers that kind of help us out. So I think that the layout and spacing here is, is quite clear in terms of the direction that we should go. So the headings and numbers in this case, and so that kind of takes us through. I think the use of color here is also somewhat better because it kind of has things separated out, right? Um, there's less free space, but I still think the poster is pretty eye-catching. It's not, it's, not it's not an ugly poster, right? But there's still quite a lot of words. Anybody else have any other comments? Nope, you said all. Okay. Uh -oh. And here is my last example. This poster I really liked. I ended up talking with this young lady. Um, she was a student when she presented this work, um, but now she is a faculty member. And this is the, something that she presented at a, at a poster presentation. Um, I thought that it was really cool because it's very non-traditional. I think when you see this poster, you're thinking, this is interesting, right? I wanna go up, I wanna talk to this person. The layout is just kind of unique the way that she's included the image there in the middle that is kind of the focus of the area that she was studying. So it's a very non-traditional format. There's no numbers um, or traditional headings, but I think the redirection is pretty obvious. And it's possible that maybe the redirection in this particular poster doesn't matter that much. And I thought her use of color and images was also very good. And so I, I really like this poster. The next thing I want to talk about after kind of the spacing and flow of your poster is the use of fonts, okay? And so there's really kind of four different um, font types that you can have in terms of colors. And that is, as example here, dark on light. This is the best choice. Dark letters on a light background are very easy for people to see. Light on dark is also pretty good. Now, the only negative, if I, if I could say there was a negative of having light letters on a dark background, is you're going to use more ink to print the poster, right? Because you're going to need to create that very, or a, create a dark background. Um, it's just going to use more ink. 
right? Now, dark on dark, while it's not bad, it's not as good as the first two. And light on light is, I'm calling it the rock bottom. That's something that you definitely want to stay away from in terms of your font choices. Also, the use of both serif fonts and sans serif. Okay, so if we're going to use serif fonts, we're going to use those for the body. Okay, and we're going to use sans serif for titles and headings. Okay, so for sans serif, these here, these are great for your titles and your headings, right? They're big, right? But for your body text, when those letters get small, we really want to use the serif. In other words, we want to use the little curls. You guys see how the letters have these little extra pieces on them? That's the serif. And so that's great because that gives more cue to what that word is. And so even if a person's standing kind of far away and they see the curve of the letters, they can more easily determine what that letter is even when standing a little bit further away. And so if you're gonna use both types, let's stick with the serif for your body text and the sans serif for your title. The text should be clear from a distance of about six feet. So if you have the ability to print some of that text out on a piece of paper and put it up on the wall, you can kind of see that. So that usually means that the body text should be greater than or equal to about 20 point font. And the title should be about one and a half inches tall. Sometimes that's as big as 120 point font. Consider not using title case or all caps. That, that requires more um, effort to read due to lack of height cues. And what I mean by that is the following. If you look, if you use all caps here, these words are not as easy to distinguish between the different letters as it is when you don't use all caps. So when you see, for example, the word cat in all caps versus cat spelled this way, the shorter A and the T, just the fact that that T sticks up a little bit gives a reader some indication that that is a certain letter, right? Certain letters stick above when they're small, whereas your A does not. As an example with dog, with the G, certain letters go under, right? Like the J and the G, they go under the other letters. Whereas if you use all caps, there's no indication, right? And so a lot of times it's better to use not all caps if you want your title or other things to really be visible and understandable by people, even from a distance. Try not to use more than three different fonts, including italics or bold. And so we can go, you know, guys, we go crazy with sometimes. I mean, I've looked at posters that I've made before and I'll have some bold stuff here and I have some letters over here that are in red and then I have some that are underlined and then some others that are really important and they're bold and italics, right? And it, gets, it can get really out of control. So let's try to not use too many different styles of text. Use italics instead of underlining. Oops. And let's avoid text blocks greater than 10 sentences or wider than 40 characters. And really, guys, this is just a kind of a number just to kind of be as a guide. And what we're getting at here is we don't want to have these huge paragraphs of tons of written text. Don't bullet or otherwise punctuate section headings. Instead, let's use large font or bold. That's sufficient. We don't need the bullets um, on our poster like we often would have like in a PowerPoint presentation. Now for graphics and our visual aids. Let's consider um, color schemes. This is what we're gonna focus on in this section. Guys, we're going to look at color schemes, um, background colors, and background images. Uh, the fact that sometimes we just use too many graphics and some artistic considerations. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, resolution and using images uh, from the internet. So for color scheme, we're going to stick, or I'm suggesting that you guys stick to two or three colors. Okay, so we, we, less is more in this case, right? So let's stick to two or three colors. Neighboring colors on the color wheel, you guys see I have that color wheel up there. They look great together, okay? So if you're wondering, I, see, I'm a person, I, I can struggle with colors. 
So a color wheel actually helps me when I'm putting together a poster. Many people are not like that. Many people kind of are, it's very easy for them to put together colors, whether it be clothing or the color you wanna paint your apartment, right? So it just depends. But what we mean by that is we look at this color wheel, this blue and this green, right? Will look good together on a poster, right? They kind of go together. Same thing with um, a green and a yellow or a red and a purple, okay? These colors look good together. For contrast on your poster, in small quantities, we can use colors that are across from each other. They're great for contrast, for, for bringing something out, right? And so for an example, we have a lot of orange and yellow, but for a highlight, we choose like a purple or a blue, right? So we go across the color wheel, we wanna just show something as a splash of color right, the, as a contrast. So here's an example of that. Look at this poster, right? So what have they done? They got the green and they got the yellow, right? And so those two colors, when you look at it, very appealing, right? It's a nice looking poster, kind of kind of calm and kind of cool, right? Same thing here, right? And so we have, ooh, I don't even know what kind of, well, anyway, these two colors, they look like we're in this range, right? So I would say kind of a orange and a light orange are those two colors. I don't know how better to explain it than those two guys. And you can see the yellow popping in there, various locations, right? And so still colors that are very near to each other look great together. And look at this one. So we have these two blues, right? We have a dark blue and a light blue. And then when we want to really kind of bring something out to kind of, you know, like this little burst of color to highlight something, we go across the color wheel to kind of a red orange. And so you see that's what they've done here, right? And so they have um, certain titles in red and they even got this little message, this little um, area here, this little text box here also in red, right? And so you can kind of see how they're working with the color wheel. Well, it's possible that people didn't even work with the color wheel again. Some people just kind of know how to do this right off the bat. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of work on color schemes. Let's look at part B, which is background colors and background images. So for background colors and images, pale um, pastels or neutrals, right? Like a beige, ivories, um, top gray, taupe gray. Um, these backgrounds can unify and enhance the material that's on top. Okay, so this is like, sometimes you have a poster and you're like, I don't really want the background just to be white. I want it to be something else, but not too dark, right? And so it's great to have like a kind of a neutral background. But one thing we wanna be careful of guys is we don't want the background to overpower, right? Whatever that background is, whether it's an image or if it's a just a, a, a color, right? And so here's an example, right? And so we have this poster this young lady has up and you see we kind of have this neutral kind of pinkish background, right? And so great. Another example, right? Um, I kind of prefer the one on the right, right? That kind of softer background, kind of like a beige or kind of whatever in terms of the background here on this um, uh, poster. So we have a pale background kind of on the left more of a neutral background on the right. So I think both of these look better than they would if you were just plain white in terms of your background color. Now, colorful backgrounds help with lots of background images and graphs. Okay, so what do we mean by that? So, on this particular poster, there's a lot of things that are being shown, right? We have a lot of graphs um, to show here. We got some images of the preparation, kind of the tools they were using to conduct the experiment over here. And so what we use then is kind of this gradient purple in the background to kind of set everything off. And it kind of gives the poster with these kind of um, lines that are going at an angle kind of gives it a little bit more, makes it a little bit more interesting, right? It's still a straight color, right? There's still not any, there's not an image in the background as an example. And in this case, there's so much here that 
if there was an image, you probably couldn't very well see it, you know, like an actual picture as the background instead of a color. But, I'm, but I am going to show you guys one of those in a second. What do you guys think about that? Here we have a poster that actually does have a photograph as the background. Any, any comments? It's very distracting. <laughs> it's very distracting. Anybody else think it's pretty distracting? It's unique. It's very unique. I, I like it. I think, okay, his, I don't know how big this is on, you, on your screens, guys, but it says the title is Determining Functional Linkages Between Virulent Genes of Porphy something gingivitis. I think so he's talking about the teeth the gums the mouth right so he has a picture of a mouth on his poster i can say one thing about this i think you i have this feeling that a lot of people wanted to come up and talk about this poster they may not even be interested in it but it's one of those things when you're walking by you can't help but look over and and look at it it's, it's very unique right and if you notice guys on his tie he actually has a tie that has toothpaste, a tube, and a toothbrush on it. So this guy is fully in. He has the pink shirt with the pink background with the mouth. So he he's doing he's doing the most, right? But I I like it. Here's another example with an actual photographic image as the background. What do you guys think here? Anybody? I, I actually kind of like this one. Yeah. Same. I do too. It's good. Yeah. Now notice it is a leaf, right? His, his background is foliage, right? And his topic is anatomy of the aborted nodules of R50, something, something new, uh, mutant. So <laughs> that's, this is not my area, but my guess is that he's talking about plants and plant cells or something. Um, and he has a plant as his background. Now, guys, that's that's an obvious one. Um, uh, my grad, one of my grad students and I, we were putting together a a poster a couple of weeks ago, and some other students for this presentation, and it was a space based theme for the the work that we had done. So it came to us. We had a plain background, and then we were like, you know what? Why don't we find an image? of space and then use that as our background. So we searched through Google and we found basically a picture of like the universe, but it had just the right amount. It was kind of muted, right? But you could still tell, anybody could tell looking at it, it was a picture of some aspect of the universe or galaxy, right, of our galaxy. And so you kind of see some little stars and it was kind of, you know, it, it almost made it a cool background that just wasn't plain, but was relevant to our topic. And so that's something that I can always encourage, just like we see here on the left, you don't want your image to overpower the thing that you're talking about. And I think some of you think that the one on the left does overpower somewhat. Okay, now too many graphics and other artistic um, considerations. We want to always keep it simple. Um, try not to use legends on a graph, label your lines directly. Now, this is not an easy one. I'm gonna explain this because many of us are using MATLAB and Excel and other things. It might not be as easy to do this, but I'm gonna show you if you can, how nice it looks when you, when you can get rid of the legends and do something different. And we wanna consider that tables are hard to read. We wanna graph our, date, our data if it is possible. Okay, and so let's get into that. So here's an example. We have a graph somebody's put on their uh, poster, right? And look how they directly label those lines, right? And so the upper line here at 80% believing says, humans created by supernatural entity. So they just write it exactly right there. And they have, have this little guy, I guess this is supposed to be the supernatural entity that they're showing um, this little figure. 
is supposed to represent. And then down here at the bottom, it says, and notice the colors, right? Because these two get kind of close, but then you can see that the green one refers to the green line. Humans evolved from non-human ancestors. And so you see this guy, he's kind of like half, half uh, monkey, half uh, human. And then the bottom, it says no opinion, right? And so this is kind of cool, right? It's kind of neat. And it's very easy to see, you know exactly what you're talking about versus a legend over here that had a little purple line and said something, a little green line and had a little thing next to it. And you probably shortened them greatly to squeeze it into this little square, right? If you were using MATLAB as an example or Excel, but, but this is nice, right? So it's a little different and it's not as easy to do, especially for some of us that might not be as artistically capable, right? But given some time, right? Working on your poster ahead of time, some of these things you, you can definitely put into practice. Now, tables versus graphs, okay? Um, look at this poster that we have here. Down at the bottom, look at these tables right here, the bottom left. This table has a lot going on. And it's not huge, it's not as big as it would be obviously in a, in a big poster, but imagine coming up and trying to kind of get a feel for what this person is trying to explain here. Right, and so you're, you're, you'd be reading down here on the left, but you're reading across and you're trying to see, okay, which numbers are greater than others. And then you're looking up here to see, okay, what are those, these column headings? So this right here is just not an easy, it was probably very easy for the person to think like this in terms of putting this information together. But then look at these over here, right? The graphs, the graphs are just a lot easier to deal with. Now, in this particular poster, they're explaining different things, but the, what I'm submitting to you all is that graphs are a lot easier to read than tables. So I'm saying to you guys, say no to tables, right? Say yes to graphs. Okay. Any comments on, those, on that, that point? No. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, too many graphics and other artistic considerations continued. Remember that half of poster creation is artistic. Therefore, it's going to be very personal, guys. Some of the rules have to be taken with a grain of salt. Okay. And so here I'm kind of going to try to show you guys how something might go against a rule that we had, but it really still looks, at least I like it in this particular case, okay? So here, we don't wanna have a lot of graphs and figures on our poster, right? And so, I mean, look at this thing. This thing has a lot. Now, I, I think this is still a good looking poster, but the question you have to ask yourself is again, from the very beginning of my presentation, what do you want viewers of your poster to leave with? What is the main thing that you're get, trying to get them to see? Can you do that in fewer images? Now, do we just want to get ourselves down to one image? Definitely, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that, do we want 20 images? Right? Do we want 20 different things that a person wants uh, needs to look at on your poster? So while I do think this is a great poster, the question would be, um, don't we wanna keep ourselves down to fewer than eight graphs or figures? And I think the answer is generally less, even though this is a nice looking poster. Now, large amounts of primary colors can be distracting. Now, there's, a, I think, way too much going on on this particular poster in terms of ideas and graphs and um, pictures and uh, chemical bonds. It's just a lot happening, right? But I don't think that the primary colors here being this green, red, and blue that are being used are too bad, right? I don't think they are that bad together. But I do think in terms of some of the other items here that fly in the face of some of the things I've been kind of trying to explain to you guys, especially the, for the number of figures um, and things that people are gonna have to look at on your poster, this is way over the top. So resolution of images, a 300 DPI, 
um, 150 DPI minimum image will look crisp when, when it is printed. And this is important, guys, because a lot of us are going onto um, the web and just searching using Google, right? We click on the image tab and we're grabbing our images off the web. We wanna make sure that those images are high resolution. If you enlarge the image, the effective DPI is reduced by that same fraction. You can check image DPI um, in Windows Explorer by right-clicking and selecting properties or summary. Um, I, I'm sure there's something very similar if you're working um, in a, um, a Mac OS. So this is what we don't want to have. Okay, here's an example. This is 300 DPI um, at 100%, and it's 0.85 inches by one inch. And this is something I copied from the web. Now, when you put it on your poster and you blow it up and it gets to that size, then you start to get a lot of pixelization, right? Pixelated um, stuff going on in your image, right? You can see a little dinosaur in this case, it started to look pretty bad. Right. And so we got to make sure that even if um, we find something on the web that we really like, is it of high enough quality to go onto our poster in terms of resolution? Maybe not. Right. And so we want to be careful of that. Now, dotting I's and crossing T's, we're going to consider these four items titles and authors, schools, school and affiliation icons your references and your acknowledgements. Okay, so for your titles and your authors, that's gonna normally be at the top of your poster. We want no more than two lines for your title, right? And so we'll shrink it down a little bit. We don't wanna have a three or four line title. Um, we don't want to underestimate the ability of a catchy title to attract passers-by. And so if, it's, if there's a requirement that you're a uh, paper title be the same as on the poster, well, then you don't have a choice, right? And then you, your, your work hopefully went into picking a great title for your paper. But when you get to your poster, let's pick something that's kind of catchy, right? Something that will draw people to your poster. List of authors under the title and center if it's more than one line. And we want to include generally your school affiliations, especially if they are multiple, right? And so that's definitely something that you're going to have to focus on. And so here's that area that we're that I'm talking about right now up at the top. Um, just kind of blown up here, you can see their list of authors. And normally, guys, chances are you're doing some collaborative work. And so you have people from different um, schools, different areas even. And so you have these little superscripts, the same that you would in a paper. Um, we're also calling out things like our school and the people who have sponsored the research. In this case, it looks like NASA and the Office of Science have sponsored, right? And also this other, these other areas, right? Now, the icons um, for the schools and the affiliations, um, we're obviously getting those, and a lot of times we're getting those from the net, and we're placing them on this poster, usually in the top, um, either corner or the bottom. And we don't necessarily want to distract, but there are some things that we need to consider when placing or grabbing these particular images. We still want to follow our resolution rules, right? And so we want to make sure that if we make these um, icons larger, they will still look good. And we also want to make sure that often these are transparent, right? So let's say, for example, you grab an icon and the background has a color for this particular icon. So you grab FAMU, but it has a background and you put it on a white back poster, a poster with a white background. Now your icon looks a little funny, right? And so you wanna be searching out there for transparent backgrounds. And that's a, a thing that you can select when you're searching on Google. And I'm sure most of you realize that. Also, in your individual departments or colleges, um, there is likely an area, if you talk to the department chair area or the dean of that college, there's usually someone around that has the stock images or the stock icons for your college. Um, in engineering, that, look, that place is called Marcom, and they're B226, and they have logos stored online that you can grab, and they do have transparent backgrounds, and so they'll look great on your poster. 
So as an example, look at this uh, image of for Florida A&M, right? Um, here, this one has a white background. So if you put that on your poster, like this poster that's shown here, you put that up here in this green area, it's going to look kind of weird, right? And so you'd want one where all this white is gotten rid of. Now, many of you may have some skills, let's say in Adobe Photoshop or some other um, application like that, and you can turn an icon like this into a transparent icon. And that's not uncalled for. Also, here we have an example of the transparent icon. And so the FAMU Rattler icon, that's transparent. You see it's on this um, slide that I'm showing you guys that has this greenish kind of background. And you can see that green coming through, right, all in this area. And so you know that this was, and even here in the, in the snake's mouth, and so you can see that it was a transparent icon. And so just be careful with things like that. The, we're trying to have a professional poster and things like that would definitely show that you were kind of rushing and not paying close attention. Your references. So um, this is the, you're using for the sources for your work. This is not always mandatory um, for a poster. Some people like to include them, and it, it may even be required by your particular conference. They should be placed at the bottom of the poster and use the same format as for a paper in your particular research area. And so here we kind of show how those look. Okay. And again, whatever the format is, whatever is being used, um, uh, the reference formatting for your particular and AMLM, I forgot the name of some of them, but um, use whatever is normal for your area. Your acknowledgments. You often want to thank individuals, groups for their specific contribution. I know a lot of times students are working with one another, um, and so they want to thank the other grad students, thank their advisor, thank the person who funded the research. This is very normal, right? Um, definitely mention your sponsors or those who provided funding. Right there, there even is a case I heard about where someone wrote up a bunch of stuff and they never thanked their sponsor, and the sponsor was very irate and would not give them any additional funding because it was a it was a big deal for what the person had discovered, but they didn't they didn't thank the person who had paid for it. Um, keep it concise, approximately forty words in terms of that um, acknowledgement, and there's the acknowledgement there. You can just see um, how the person. Kind of focused even on in terms of how uh, different parties uh, helped in the research. Okay, last but not least, um, using PowerPoint, um, there are many great uh, templates out there, um, and I would encourage you guys to look at them. I mean, they can really help get you started. Um, so consider them, they're online, and you can just search for PowerPoint poster templates. Um, it's a great way to choose a creative layout, and you can simply download them and open in PowerPoint and edit them as you, as you desire. Um, and here I just have some steps, and I'm not going to belabor um, the steps. I think many of you probably have done some of this before and are used to the steps, right, like starting a new slide, um, setting your margins and so on. And again, just kind of completing some of the steps that could be used. And I'll put my, many of you, some of you may have my email address. I'll put my email address in the um, chat. And anybody who wants these slides to kind of look back at some of the things that I covered here, I have no problem just sending um, a copy of the slides to you via email. Okay. And finally here, um, you um, can modify the themes that you find online and go into more detail and as we talked about adding backgrounds and whatnot to kind of make your theme and make your poster really stand out. Now there's one final thing that I want to suggest to you guys um, to do. This is after you kind of had your poster created, which means you have to start early. I can't stress that enough. Actually, let me tell, let me say this quick thing. I, I did once have a student who really waited to the last minute to work, really to kind of finalize and, and finish up his poster. Our conference that we were going to was in Puerto Rico. And so it was a great, I mean, sometimes you have a conference in a great venue like that, a great city 
where you can go and really enjoy yourself someplace maybe you've never even been before. And this student actually missed the plane because they waited so late to finish their poster, it was still being printed as we were taking off. And so I know, I know you guys would never do that, right? But it's just another indication if you start early, you can really have time to not only make a good poster and make the plane, but you'll have time for this last bit of advice, getting feedback. Get feedback on your poster, right? So a lot of times for your papers, you've worked with your advisor, you've worked maybe with another student, maybe even a more senior student or postdoc. And so you, there's been a lot of back and forth. And the poster is that thing that you kind of waited to do and you don't have enough time, but I really want you to do whatever you can to get feedback. So before you complete your poster, get feedback from coworkers, friends, and there's even websites, right? And so those website, betterposters.blogspot.com and others, you can submit your poster and people will comment. And uh, let's see, upload the poster draft to a website geared to poster review and advice. And there used to be a place called um, Pimp My Poster. So <laughs> I know most of you guys are probably familiar with Pimp My Ride. Right. And so somebody takes their car, really tricks it out, makes it all cool. Right. Well, there used to be a place just like that for posters. It was called Pit My Poster. And you put your poster there and people would comment. Now, the poster you guys see here on the screen that I showed earlier was that young lady did upload that poster to this website. And this is some of the comments that she got at the time. So she, people said, I would like to see one of the other maps on the middle spot since those have much more interesting information, okay? And so I think they were talking about this map down here and this map. They were saying they would love to see those maps here instead of the one that she chose, which is something that maybe she could consider, right? Um, good font choice and the flow seems to work nicely. Somebody else said, there's also a lot going on in the title space. Oops, oops. Oh my God, I thought I put that on. Anyway, um, uh, let's see. There's a lot going on in the title space, particularly over in the right-hand side. And I think they're probably talking about here, right? Where she has, I guess these are some of the people who maybe sponsored her work or worked with her. And then it says text in the upper right blue box is small and the order of reading is not clear. So I think, okay, so this blue box, I think they're talking about some of the text like in these areas. So basically they're saying the text is getting very small and they can't read it. And so you may not have a place where you can upload your poster like that, but many of you have friends maybe on Facebook, different schools, you could upload it there and have comments, people uh, comment and let you know some things that look great on your poster and some things that you may wanna consider changing. Now, I thought I said last but not least a little while ago. Anyway, um, almost finished. Um, now, at this point, after you've gotten your comments back and you've made the changes and adjustments and edits, you're ready to print. Now, this is going to be based upon where you're printing it. Now, if you're in engineering, you should save your PowerPoint as a PDF file and you should um, contact Tricia. She will be doing the printing at Marcom. She'll tell you when it will be ready. If you're in a different college, whatever department you happen to be in, chances are there is a place where you, a large format printer where you can print your poster. You should talk to them and find out how long it's going to take to print and <clears throat> what format they require. And again, don't wait till the last minute. So in conclusion, just like your work, creating a successful poster requires creativity. Posters marry the technical to the artistic. So there are rules and suggestions to guide you. And there are even templates to ease your frustration. Finally, solicit feedback from the community so that you can improve. And that's all I have for you guys today. And here's some references. Um, are there any questions? No question from me. No questions? Let me see, I have one thing in the chat. Let me see, let me share this. Oh, please share the slides. Okay, a couple yeah. of people have put there. I'm going to, just in case I get too many, let me go ahead and put in my email address here. I don't have a question. Um, I have more of like a comment. Um, but like, 
I feel like Reddit is also a good site where we can get feedback on things. Um, people on Reddit are pretty responsive and I'm sure there's like a place where we can like upload a poster and people can critique it. Thank you, Ariana. That's great. Great. Um, Reddit, is that R-E-D-D-I-T dot com? Yes, sir. Okay, great. I have heard of that site um, and that's great information. Thank you. Um, I Anybody have a else com comment? Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Okay, so my comment is I usually use Canva. So it's kind of like PowerPoint, but they have like a lot more templates and fonts that you could use for your posters. Tell me the name again, Nancy. Um, Canva, C-A-N-V-A. -A. Canva. So Canva is the name of the application. Yes. So it's okay. Canva.com and they have so many templates that you could use to create your poster with. Okay, thank you very much. That's good. I did not know of that site. That's great. Anyone else? Comments or questions? Okay, guys. We just had a few couple of minutes left, so I didn't want to you know, rush off if, if there is anybody thinking about something or maybe has a question. Okay, well, I'm hoping that you all enjoyed the presentation. I hope you got something from it and be sure to check in next Monday at the same time, 12 to one, uh, and the focus there will be on more traditional, not poster, but um, normal slide presentations that are really uh, ramped up. Um, a very cool way, ever since I saw this presentation a few years ago on, on this topic, I have changed the way that I do my presentations in terms of um, just some of the things that, that uh, Dr. Johnson will talk about, okay? And so I think you will learn a lot and it will kind of I think it would change the way you look at your presentations, whether they be for in class, you know, group work, or even at a national conference where you're presenting your research. So definitely tune in next Monday at noon. And again, on the 8th of November, so not this coming Monday, but the next one, we'll be talking about um, uh, conference etiquette. And so as a student, as a student, maybe even nearing graduation, right, um, or younger, right, this could be also valid, not just for grad students, but undergraduates, going to conferences and meeting other students and walking up to faculty members and saying hello and telling them what your research is about and all of that good stuff, how to answer questions that might be very difficult after your presentation, um, all that kind of stuff we'll talk about on the 8th of November from 12 to 1, okay, all on Zoom, and the Zoom link is not going to change. And so you can use the same Zoom link we use today. Excuse All me, right, thank you guys. Go ahead. Excuse me, did you send the reminder for the next meeting for the next session? Did you send yes, us a reminder? Yes. Just to make sure that we appreciate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, I've I asked a couple of people, emails get easily lost. So we will send a uh, reminder. Yep, I appreciate Thank you. Okay. All right, anybody else? All right, guys, thank you very much. And I'll see you guys hopefully on the next presentations. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.